Okay, product development, what is it? So before you start this video, you got a definition of it. It is the creation, production, and marketing of products from start to finish, from concept to consumer. So that's what we're gonna talk about. Uh, in this part of the lecture, lecture we're gonna talk about the different roles in product development. So we'll talk about you know, what a product line is and who develops it. We'll talk about uh, the role of the merchandiser, designer, uh, and uh, just briefly on retailer. In the next part of the section, we'll talk about the, the role of the retailer uh, and we'll talk about the stages in product development. This section is the who, what, when, why, and what, right? So what is what is a product line? A, a product line is, uh, is developed um, in order to um, to sell either wholesale or directly directly at retail. So um, I want you to make sure uh, in the textbook that you understand what the term line is used versus the term collection. Um, so line versus collection. That's going to that, that's, I'm going to give you that to go look at. It will listen. It will definitely be on the exam. So line versus versus collection. But who develops a product line and who develops a product uh, collection? And in this part of the lecture, we're going to be talking more about the role of the designer um, in developing a product line. In the next part of the lecture, we'll talk about it as a as a as the retailer as as a retailer doing the product development for their own their own line. So, so again, product development on the on the designer side um, is just the process of designing, planning, and making sellable products for for a, a designer's uh, target customer. So we'll talk about the designer in just a second, but first let's talk about the role of the merchant um, merchandiser. We're going to hear this word merchandiser used. Um, Retail uses this word in a, in a couple different iterations, but uh, in this instance, for this definition, a merchandiser is a person who channels the creativity, <laughs> channels the creativity of a designer. So, you know, the designer is the creative person. The merchandiser is the one that says, this is how much money we have to spend. This is what we spent last year. This is what our sales project projections look like, right? So the merchandiser is partly responsible for that marketing mix that we've talked about, the the P's, right? The price, place, promotion, and product. They're responsible for giving the designer, the designer has the vision, and they, the merchandiser, um, the merchandiser has the other part of, of the business, has the business part of the business. And, you know, the merchandiser has to view the, um, the products that they're producing from the design point of, point of view, but also from the production and the sales point of view. So the, the merchandiser uh, in this sense is gonna have an overarching role. Now, when we get to the next part of the, sec of the lecture, um, when we talk about careers, we'll be talking about merchandisers and we'll be talking about them in specific categories, what they do for product development. And I share some examples of the merchandisers that we had at, at Ralph, okay? The designer, the designer, you know, their job is to, you know, envision, um, you know, gather inspiration, look at trends, uh, develop themes um, for the garments that are going to be sold, right? So the designers do what the designers do. They're the creative brain of, of the brand. So they sketch and they drape and they, you know, create samples. Um, they, uh, but they do have to keep some practical business considerations in mind. And again, uh, in this section of the lecture, we're talking about designers as, you know, high fashion designers or freelance artist designers or stylist designers. Um, the book gives great definitions of what those are. So I will make sure you know what those three are. Um, in the next part of the lecture, we'll be talking about technical designers. So we'll talk about designers that, that create things just in a product development sense for private for private label brands uh, for pri private label brands and for store brands and sometimes for manufactured brands that are sold at wholesale. But in this part of the lecture, we're talking about the artsy, the high fashion, the fashion forward designers. Okay, um, and then finally, the producer. The producer has has a role as well, and um, the producer's role. Um, 
is, you know, the manufacturer. So the person that actually produces, you know, the factory that that makes the, the garments. Um, there is a jobber. Uh, and again, retail uses the, the word jobber in two different um, with two different meanings. So when we say apparel jobber, they take care of the designing, planning, um, purchasing, you know, cutting. Uh, in the next part of the lecture, we'll talk about a jobber. And in that sense, when the garments already produce a a retail jobber um, takes garments that aren't quite they're like a third party, they're an intermediary. So when you see things, we see brand names that are in Ross or or Marshalls, um, they essentially have gone through they have gone through a jobber. Um, and then there is the apparel contractor. So the apparel contractor's job is to um, is to produce just sole functions, is to apply you know sewing services, just putting the garments together. So um, so that's what we're going to be talking about. That's what we're going to be talking about um, in this part of the lecture. We're going to be talking about everything in product development from the designer standpoint. In the next part of the lecture, we're going to be talking about um, product development just on the retail producer side. So for the store label store label side. Each season, the high fashion designers, um, high fashion designers, uh, put together a put together their lines, and these are the the dates. Um, actually, these are the seasons and the dates that they're normally shown. So when we see um, when we see Fashion Week, so um, normally September um, for New York and October for uh, LA and, and Dallas for for spring. Um, you know, COVID changed some things up. So some folks showed in September um, in New York and some designers are doing virtual presentations for October. Uh, spring and summer is early January, fall, um, February, uh, resort and cruise. So that's a special little season. And again, we're talking about high-end designers, right? So uh, resort cruise is um, is kind of that period between Thanksgiving and the first of the year because people with discretionary money they go to resorts and that's when they go on cruises so that's why it's called resort cruise and then holiday is in um, is in in New York in July so we we know when we we know a fashion week right so fashion week in September. Fashion Week in July, New York Fashion Week. And then, of course, Paris and Milan have their own Fashion Weeks. Um, L.A. has a much smaller version. Dallas, as well, has a, has a much smaller version. And then, you know, we have some emerging some emerging countries that uh, produce their Fashion Week. So um, there's Fashion Week in Dubai. Um, there's fa Fashion Week in um in um why, why is it just escaping this fashion week in japan and hong kong there we go it took me a minute fashion week in hong kong and some of the major cities in india are doing fashion week as well you know and fashion week has become such a thing that even places that you don't think about have fashion week so like akaragana has fashion week and south africa and johannesburg has a fashion week i follow some of the some designers from those areas so i've actually seen some Really interesting online fashion weeks uh, from Lagos, Nigeria, as well. I, I love African uh, prints, um, African-inspired stuff. So, um, so I follow those as well. So, Fashion Week really has become a worldwide phenomenon with smaller versions all over the world. But in the United States, it's all about New York, right? Uh, in Europe, it is all about Paris and and Milan. Those are the major. Uh, major uh, season, major fashion weeks, and the seasonal lines are shown are shown then. Again, we're going to talk about you know the role of the designer in developing in developing those lines. You know, for um, fashion weeks that are in uh, September um, and October, those designers really are looking at. Um, at their inspiration, they're they're starting. Essentially, they start the next line as soon as one line is done. So, if we're looking at um, at spring, right, as soon as they are done with holiday, um, 
they they dive right back in the spring. There's no rest for the weary in, in fashion. So uh, as soon as actually before July even before July even starts, they're usually uh, working on it in in March April, get gathering their inspiration. But um, the role of a designer is they're in nonstop designing mode, right? They are in nonstop designing mode, and you know for many of the top designers that we think of, they actually have a design team. They have they provide inspiration and in mood boards, and then it's up to their team to follow that inspiration in, in, in mood mood board and, and actually develop um, develop the designs. And, and I'm not going to say that there aren't designers that do their own sketching and do everything, but most of them work with the team and they um, direct the team. You know, for many uh, for many high end brands, they their designer isn't even known as a designer. They're known as the creative director, right? So their job is to hire the best design talent that has their aesthetic, has the aesthetic of the brand that they run and um, and lead the charge, right? And lead the charge. So, you know, designers um, or, or the head of fashion houses may, while their background is in design, they have been designers at some point, they actually don't do all of the sketching. It is a. It is definitely a team effort to get a Gucci item um, on 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 the shelf of a store. It didn't. It didn't come through the work of one person. It came through a collaborative effort with a creative designer and a high end design team and inspiration. And it is a. You know, it is a collaborative effort to get high end. Um, high-end designs created. Okay, so what are the steps? What are the steps? Um, now, when we get to the next part of the lecture, when we talk about product development from the retailer's perspective, there are many more <laughs> steps. There are like, it's more than double the number of steps when the retailer is doing uh, doing production for themselves. So make sure you understand these six steps. There will be Definitely an exam question, um, maybe two, on these six steps. I'm not going to ask you for the 15 steps, or actually I think it's 16, maybe 17 steps on the retailer side, but please, please understand these six steps. And I'm going to get part of it here. The book goes into much more detail, so make sure you understand, understand these steps. And if you look at the steps here, pretty self-explanatory, right? Planning, getting in inspiration looking at the trends, doing some market research, finding out what sold last season really well, what didn't sell, right? What's the color story going to be? Um, you know, what are the things that are really important um, to to their customers? So just planning, planning what they're going to do, right? Uh, the next step is creating the design concept. So um, that's when individual gar garments come in, right? So long sleeve, short sleeve, puff sleeve, you know, cuff, no cuff, um, you know, capri, slim leg, jogger, jogger leg, um, you know, wide leg, extra wide leg, you know, all, all of those pieces. So this is, you know, developing each garment, um, developing each garment and how that garment is going to fit into the overall story that they want to tell. So, right, so how many tops, what's their top to bottom ratio? And, and generally, um, a designer will do three tops for every one bottom. Um, you know, what is the outerwear piece? What is the special piece? What is the, what is the, the piece that the other pieces in the collection or the line are going to, are going to kind of sprout out, sprout, sprout out from, okay? Then um, developing the, the designs really is, making sure that um, that there's some sample garments, right? So developing the sample garments. So when I worked at Ralph, I'll talk about this and I'll talk about this more in the other part of the lecture. When I worked at Ralph, we actually had a fit model. Um, so we would start from a cat. We're going to talk about cats next. We would start from a cat. We would order a sample. The sample will be made based on the specifications for that garment. So for the outlet division, we had specifications for what a size medium was going to be, you know, shoulder, bust, uh, waist, length. We Sometimes we had length. We had control over the length of the garment itself, but based on what was called a spec sheet. So developing a sample and then having the fit model try it on to make sure it fits the way we want it to fit. And if not to develop some tweaks so creating a creating a sample and in that part in that creation right we 
had um, had we used cats, right? So in in that process, um, for Ralph, we actually pulled from archival CAD. So we did not create anything from scratch. We pulled from products that Ralph already had created and sold, and we had some history on. We translated them to the outlet division. So we used um, you know different fabric and trim to make them to make them cost effective, right? Um, next is that planning the production after you've gotten your sample made, you know, fortunately, uh, Ralph had its set of factories in, and a designer will already have the factories that they do business with. So this planning the production is really having a good understanding of how long it take, it may take to get a fabric to, um, have the fabric shipped to, uh, the production facility cut, sewn and ready for the stores. And, and generally there are specific timelines. So when I worked at Ralph, we knew we had eight months from the time we started with planning until the, the, the garments usually hit the store. So in that window of time, we had a window of time that we had to, that we had to, that we had to, sorry, I can't get it out. <laughs> we had, a, we had a, a small window of time that we had to get the designs to the factory so that we knew we could get them, get them, um, in the store in time. I'm sorry, I, I stumbled on, on that section, right? And then the next piece is just the production. So how long does it take for them to cut, so um, package and ship it to us, and then finally getting uh, getting the orders actually into the distribution center, uh, into the warehouses, and ultimately into the store. So again, make sure you read this section of your textbook. It's very specific. It gives you a lot of information. There will definitely be a question on the exam about this. Next, we're going to talk about, and we're not going to spend a lot of time uh, on it. We're going to talk about the product development uh, process. Our next chapter, uh, we're going to talk about the categories, right? So um, the product development proce process uh, can be um, can be done by a couple of different ways. So just specializing in products. So um, I told you when I worked for Ralph Lauren, I worked for the outlet division. I worked in knits and sweaters, right? So we just did ladies' knits and sweaters. So anything that was not woven or a bottom, we took care of and, and sweaters. Um, but also um, product development can be done by, you know, gender, age, and size. Um, so it could be, you know, a buyer that, that could have all the male product or all the female product. I worked for a retailer in Buffalo called Life, Lifestyle Street Gear, um, where I bought, um, we just had juniors and, no, that's not true. We had juniors, men's, and, and kids. Um, but I bought all of the kids and juniors. And then there was a silver buyer that bought all of the men's stuff. So anything that was kids, anything that was juniors, uh, I bought. And we were a junior driven store. So um, we just had juniors and men's. Um, also, it could be by size. So when I worked at Nordstrom's, we had a whole host of buyers, and then we had a buyer that just bought uh, Petite, uh, and we had a buyer that just bought Plus, which at that time, the department was called Encore. Petite was called Petite, and the department for uh, Plus sizes was was called Encore. Um, you know, we would just be buying by, by category, so just tops, just bottom, by classification. So all of these, all of these areas have different product development processes, but they still go through the same steps. So planning, um, they go through the, the stages where they you know, plan the line, so they get the inspiration. Um, they go through the steps of um, you know, developing samples. They um, you know, fit, source, produce, and then get it into the store. So product development by these classifications uh, could, could happen as well. Uh, and again, on the designer side, you know, designers may have designer, uh, may have design, part of the design team that just works on tops, that just works on bottom. So again, this is a collaborative process, right? Because if you're the top designer, you have to work in partnership with the bottom designer. So again, at Ralph, we were knits and sweaters, but we were in um, real close collaboration with the Wovens department. So the Wovens folks had everything woven <laughs> and they had all the bottoms and they had outerwear. So they were woven, woven bottoms and outerwear. That's what they had. Um, so the, those are the, the categories and classifications that we had, right? And then again, um, on the designer um, side, it could also be 
by label. So in Ralph Lauren, we had blue label, black label, and purple label. So purple was the couture, um, black was the high-end designer, and blue label was the, I'm gonna put in my air quotes, entry level label. In that, um, in, in that as well, Lauren also had the Lauren by Lauren line, which was a brand that was um, sold wholesale to department stores. So, you know, Nordstrom's and Macy's and Neiman's would have the Lauren by Lauren line. So that was a brand underneath the Ralph Lauren label, um, but it was not part of the other labels underneath the brand, if that makes sense. All right, this is the recategory. So, um, so again, there are different processes for those as well. So um, when I when I was at Ralph, they actually, um, actually when I was at Ralph, the, the Lauren brand originally was a license. So Ralph had nothing to do with it. Um, the Jones New York company um, bought the license from Ralph and produced their own garments. But when I started at Ralph, by the time I left Ralph, Ralph had, the, they had ended their licensing agreement and those products came back under Ralph Lauren's bigger umbrella. So Ralph was uh, now in charge of that again. So there was a design team that just bought for the Lauren line. And, and now the Lauren line is actually in the Ella divisions, where, uh, in the division stores when it hadn't been in the past because it was a licensing, a licensing agreement. So there are different processes for, you know, if you specialize by product, if you specialize by gender, age, size, or category, or classification, or by brand or by label. There are some industry practices that we you, we should take note of uh, as well. Again, um, your textbook does a great job giving you much more detail. Um, so, you know these practices. Again, it will be there will be an exam question or two um, out of this section. Um, for the purpose of for the purpose of this lecture, um, I'm going to talk about them briefly. Um, manufacturers um, acting as retailers, and increasingly, increasingly, I'm going to sneeze. I feel like I'm, maybe not. Um, increasingly, manufacturers are opening are opening their own. <coughs> Bless me. I knew it was coming. Uh, manufacturers are opening uh, opening their own stores. So. You know, when we look at places like Nike, Nike is a manufacturer that only sold wholesale and now they have stores or Adidas, right? So manufacturers acting as retailers. Um, and um, and they do that uh, because it increases their bottom line. So again, they would sell a product, they would produce a product, sell it at wholesale, and then a third party would make, uh, make the profit. And they're kind of just cutting, not kind of, they're completely cutting out that middle person. So they are producing items at cost and then selling them in their stores. And oftentimes, when, and when the producer is the manufacturer, there may be a lag. So the, the, the same thing that the, is in the store at Macy's may not be in, in the Nike store at the same time. That way they give the their their wholesale partner, uh, their retail partner a chance to to sell it before it hits it hits discount. So, so retailing. I just talked about licensing a second ago when I talked about Ralph Lauren and licensing is just merchandise that has some highly recognizable name that the company doesn't itself produce. So like I said, that uh, Lauren by, by Ralph Lauren line had been a license at one point. It was an entry level uh, Ralph Lauren item, uh, Ralph Lauren items. Um, so you can get the designer brand without the high end designer price. Um, and eventually Ralph took the light, Ralph and Jones New York um, severed their their agreement, but um, licensing does exist. So the Polo Jean Company, which is also a Ralph Lauren brand, in my air quotes, is a license as well as licensed to a third party company. But right now, um, there's $103.3 billion annually in license uh, business. Um, so really, there's not much of a disadvantage to a designer to, um, to license something. They um, don't get any of the exposure of the, they don't have to worry, focus on the design, sales or marketing, but they get a percentage back. So um, really, really important. Um, so, um, you know, Christian Dior was uh, started as a license, right? So Christian Dior licensed uh, first in 1949 and was a licensed pioneer. And, you know, even though 
he died in 1957, we still see the Christian Dior name on many, many products. You know, we see shoes and jewelry and perfume and cosmetics um, under the the umbrella of, of Dior's, Dior's um, parent company. So they don't, they don't, you know, Christian Dior doesn't make Christian Dior perfume, right? They license that out to, to someone else. Um, you know, this isn't apparel, but one of the largest licensor licensees of of glasses, both sunglasses and prescription glasses, is a company um, known as Luxottica. So if you buy a pair of Gucci sunglasses or eyeglasses, they are not produced by Gucci. They are produced by Luxottica and under a license, and they are able to use the Gucci, the Gucci brand. Um, and, and licensing is big business for many designer labels because they don't want to have to worry about, you know, making all the accessories, right? So they, they pay somebody else to do that for them. All right, we're going to talk about private label um, in the next part of the lecture, so I'm not going to spend much time on that, but private label is just merchandise that's designed for uh, a company and the label is there. So INC, International Concepts at Macy's, is a is a private private label 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 brand okay um you know production is generally done offshore it's done there because labor is cheap <laughs> um it's a, a way to reduce costs they uh you know to produce something offshore you don't have to worry about the health safety and well-being of the employees of the workers that are producing those goods so that's the downside of offshore production um but it is a threat to to American uh, to American manufacturing and, and laboring. The the again the dilemma is, um, and I've said it before. Uh, the dilemma is: Are you willing to pay twenty dollars for a basic cotton T-shirt? Actually, are you willing to pay thirty dollars for it because it's produced in the United States, or do you want your cotton T-shirt to continue to be? six dollars and 87 cents at walmart right so really important um factors are just you know kind of like middleman lending agencies <laughs> that's basically way to say it um so that uh, you know goods can be produced without being paid for um make sure you read that in your book chargebacks is when something is not produced to the standard uh, to the quality standard we talk about quality control specialists in the when we get to the career section. So chargebacks are, um, you know, money that you get back from a vendor for not producing, um, not producing something at a high quality, or if something just doesn't sell sell well. You know, in retail we call it a dog. If something's a dog, you may request a chargeback from the vendor. Like you sold us some product that was horrible and nobody really wanted. Right, so um, so that so that too, okay, um, and then you know there um, since we live in a global environment, there are some you know global some codes that are that are used to classify um, to classify the type of manufacturing a company a company does. So. Um, the SIC and the NAICS are the two codes um, that reflect, um, you know, changes in in the U.S. economy. But to classify the type of establishment um, that a company primarily engages in, so it's important that you know that as well. So this entire slide, make sure you. Um, have an understanding of these, take good notes of these in the book because they, they will, again, there will be an exam question on this.